economy. New industry and the expansion of old have brought thousands of workers and their families to this city. At the same time, increasing numbers of visitors seek the holiday climate of Canada's west coast. Open spaces are disappearing. This young metropolis needs room to grow. The Fraser River has always been the broad barrier against southward extension of Vancouver, joining sea and mountains to form a band around a million people. All roads once led to a single crossing of the Fraser, carrying the growing thousands of cars and trucks from Vancouver and New Westminster. Northbound traffic from the Trans-Canada Highway and the U.S. border converged on the same span across the river, the Tello Bridge, built by the government in 1937. This was calculated to satisfy traffic demands for many years. Perhaps no one could have forecast the future of Vancouver, but there were those who watched its growth and talked of the day when the Fraser River would have to be crossed at least once again. Men like George Massey, MLA for the district south of the river. He called for a new crossing at Dease Island near the antiquated Ladner Ferry. And there was a man to put this dream into action. Honorable P.A. Gallardi, Minister of Highways, ordered engineers to investigate. They recommended a new superhighway to the river barrier. From the U.S. border, the latest in divided high-speed throughways. And for the crossing, not ferries, nor a span. This new crossing was to be a tunnel. All great engineering achievements begin in the minds of men. Men who combine their knowledge and genius in the detailed planning of a new project. This is the story of one such project, the Dease Island Tunnel, first of its kind on the North American continent and only the second in the world. It is similar in design to the mass tunnel in Holland. Dees Island Tunnel was built for the British Columbia Toll Highways and Bridges Authority. The engineers were two firms with worldwide experience, Foundation of Canada Engineering Corporation Limited and Christiani and Nielsen of Canada Limited. Dozens of other firms, contractors and suppliers also became part of the team. This was the area before construction started. A railway and road had to be moved out around the site. The North Tunnel approach was to be excavated here, and here a dry dock, and here the general working area. The river itself was helpful in excavating the dry dock. Auxiliary dikes were built to the shape of the dry dock, the river was let in, and a dredge was floated in. The dredge did the digging and was floated back into the main river. The entrance was then plugged and the dry dock pumped dry. The purpose of the dry dock was to provide a dry land area in which to build six tunnel elements utilizing conventional concrete techniques. The six elements were later floated out and sunk in a trench in the river bottom. The dry dock was dredged to a depth of 28 feet to allow the tunnel elements to draw 23 feet when floated out. In this panoramic view, we can see the early phases of the work at the tunnel site, which included construction of a concrete mixing plant 
beyond the far side of the dry dock. Gravel was spread on the floor of the dry dock before construction of the elements began. Here we can see concrete crews starting the four inch working slab from which the elements were built up. Beyond the far dike of the dry dock is the Fraser River. And in the corner of the excavation are dewatering pipes by which the working area was kept dry. These pipes led from two levels of well points around the perimeter of the dry dock. This was not unlike drilling a multitude of domestic water supply wells and constantly pumping them dry. Day and night, literally millions of gallons of water were pumped out of the dry dock into the main river. Conventional earth moving equipment was used in excavating the tunnel approaches. Here too, success depended upon efficient dewatering of river seepage. The rig in the background is driving well points. These machines, though working on dry land, were at times actually 60 feet below the Fraser River. In the three years of the Dees Island Tunnel Project, contractors moved two and a half million cubic yards of earth and rock, enough to provide basement excavations for 10,000 family houses. This was the first of many important anniversaries for the new tunnel, the day that concrete pouring began on the main construction job. On this day, the Premier of British Columbia, the Honorable W.A.C. Bennett, handled the controls. The completed approaches and tunnel elements were to use more than 100,000 yards of concrete. Now the drive was on. Men and machines joined forces in a race against time and weather, a race planned and paced at every step. The various phases of this project must be completed to an exact timetable, ready to be linked together as required. The future pattern takes shape at the North Approach and Ventilation Building on Lulu Island. Meanwhile in the dry dock, the next step in construction of the tunnel elements was to lay a steel membrane over the base slab. Steel plates would also form a collar at each end of the elements to ensure complete waterproofing at the joins. Teams of carpenters now came on the job to build formwork for the structural concrete. The massive concrete floors of the elements were up to two feet thick in the initial pouring. However, the roadway thickness was left out to give the elements buoyancy for the floating and sinking operations. Here we see how the elements were built in progressive stages throughout their length. The huge concrete boxes were 344 feet long, 78 feet wide and 24 feet high. The river was made to serve wherever possible. During construction, it provided the only access to the south approach on Dees Island. This was an example of the careful timing so necessary to the success of the project. Work on the south side had to keep pace with construction across the river so that both would be ready for the placing of tunnel elements. Only from the air was it possible to appreciate the magnitude of this engineering achievement, to see how each of the separate but simultaneous jobs had to be carried out. Here, both approaches are finished, and the tunnel elements await only final fitting out. 
From this point, the teams of tunnel builders moved into the most exacting stage of the unique undertaking. The land-based work was done. Now it would become a water operation. The pumps were reversed and the river, kept out for months, poured back into the approaches. Drag lines began to tear down the dikes they had built. The approaches were flooded so that the river trench for the first element could be dredged and excavated right up to the face of the ventilation building. The big dredge W.G. McKenzie moved into position to dig this trench for the first sinking. In the dry dock, cranes were drawing out of the earth the well points used in dewatering the area. At the end of each tunnel element, now closed by a temporary concrete bulkhead, workers hung steel bars to be used later in joining the elements. Other crews bolted a heavy rubber gasket to the outer rim. This gasket was to provide the initial seal in joining the sunken elements. Big hooks and eyes would be used underwater to pull the elements together against the gasket. In each bulkhead, watertight doors were sealed and tightened in place. These doors would provide entry to the chamber formed between the elements until the bulkheads could be taken down. As far as possible, everything that could be done on land was finished before the sinking. And the final act in the dry dock, cleaning up the debris of construction. As water flooded the dry dock and crept up the element sides, so water was also admitted into ballast chambers in the air ducts of the elements. This was to prevent the elements from floating until the engineers were ready to move them out. Here is an illustration of the next phase. Warped out of the dry dock with heavy cables, the first element was eased into the sinking rig. This specially built equipment consisted of four steel scows in pairs tied to each other by trusses. Each pair of scows was spaced just the width of an element with bare inches to spare. A special wharf was built on the site to be used for the final equipping of each tunnel element as it lay in the floating rig. Here the element was made a seaworthy submarine weighing 18,500 tons, probably the world's largest. It was ready for a voyage to the bottom of the Fraser River. With access towers and the control room installed, heavy warping lines were run out to the umbrella-shaped anchors embedded in the river bottom. Then the sinking rig, elements number one in its grip, pulled itself along the lines to the north ventilation building. But the tunnel builders were soon to realize they had a tiger by the tail, a river that would not give in easily. Even with low water conditions of early 1958, the Fraser presented a treacherous combination of currents and tides and changing buoyancy conditions. And yet another menace plagued that first sinking. Because the Fraser shipping channel had to be kept open, an observation tower was built on the riverbank. The entire sinking operation was linked by radio and protected by radar. The ship has passed. The sinking can begin. Anxious moments during the warping into position. Okay. 
one small error could mean disaster. The fog was so thick during the first sinking that engineers could barely see their marks ashore to line up the element. It took 17 hours to place the first element. Finally, number one tunnel element is in place, secured to the face of the north approach. Five more to go, and the last one must be on the bottom by early April, or the spring freshet will force ruinous delays. With the help of the model, we can do what the engineers might often have wished to do, dry up the Fraser River. Although the tunnel elements were laid in an open trench on the river bottom, backfilling with rock covered the elements and produced the same effect as an underground tunnel. Water levels remained comfortably low throughout the months of January, February, and March. The engineers had set the 120,000 cubic feet per second mark as the danger line. So far, the river kept well below the line. Twenty days after the first sinking, element number two was in place. This sinking marked another first in tunnel building history with the use of underwater television loaned by the Royal Canadian Navy. Elements three and four were the deepest, lying across the navigation channel of the river. Water level began to rise at the beginning of April. Now the enemy was time. April 5th, number five element in place. But soon the melting snowpack would turn the Fraser River to raging flood. The first favorable tide for warping out of the dry dock occurred at night. And in the darkness, every man knew without speaking the race he was running. If the river rose before number six was in place, everything would have to stop. Men and machines would lie idle. It would be at least four months before the water dropped again. The river rose steadily, inching toward the danger line. Time was running out for the tunnel builders. There could be no mistakes now. Nothing must delay the intricate operation. By dawn, the temporary foundation blocks had been placed at the fitting out jetty. The element was floated alongside the jetty and the blocks pulled up and attached to the underside of the element by cables. These men had fitted out five elements before. It was now routine. But this time it must be faster by minutes, hours, hoping to gain a day against the rising river. The two access towers over the element manholes were aligned so they would be exactly vertical when the element was inclined on the river bottom. In the controlled cabin mounted on one of the towers, precision instruments showed the position of the element at all times.
An extensive communication system ran from the cabin to the element and sinking rig. The whole operation was to be commanded from this cabin. Precious days have slipped by, but the element is ready. Now, what of the river? In the last hours, the river has risen steadily, past the danger line. But it is not yet in full flood and is actually dropping slightly. The time is now. Crews hurry to their stations. The sinking rig is making its longest trip with the least time to spare. cabin, last minute checking. The order is to start pumping water onto the element. Every man stands by, awaiting orders. Hoist operators 9, 10, 11, and 12, report in. Ask you to open hand box. I've got them ready to open it. No, I've got them. Number 11, 30, down on the B drum, 0 on A. Number 12, 40, down on the B drum, 0 on A. Number 9, 36, down on the B drum, 0 on the A drum. <coughs> You'll have to speak up, Fowler. Uh, Leo, will you have o uh, Joe open your number four hand valves now? We're going to start letting in water and start going down. Thank you. Want that for the number four? Hoist operators 9, 10, 11, and 12, be prepared to start lowering your load. Nine already. Let's take nine, nine ready. Ten. Number 11, ready to go. Number 12, ready. Six. Number 12, ready. 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 Number 12, There is tension in each man's face. Yet because of his skill and experience in the special function he performs, each has a feeling that he and his fellow workers will win this last battle against the river. Will a diver be prepared to go down? Divers could be prepared to go down. Three, three feet on the 7.3, 7.3, on the 11th, 7.4, 10 sides, above the 3-foot mark. You can stop any time. We're three feet above the 
The pressure is off, and there is time for congratulations. The actual sinking took less than half an hour. Let's get the exact location now. Can we have a reading, please, in 9, 10, 11, and 12? Please, 9, 26 tons on the bead drill. Zero. But what actually happened down there under the surface? Not even the divers could see in the silt-laden Fraser River. We can visualize the sinking with diagrams. As soon as the element sank below the surface, it was tilted to the inclination of the trench bottom. In cross-section, we will see that water was then admitted to ballast compartments and the element sank further, controlled by the winches on the sinking rig. The water ballast was adjusted continuously to counteract any uplift caused by changes in salinity of the river. The element was lowered until the temporary foundation blocks touched down on gravel pads in the tunnel trench. More water ballast was added to give the element an effective weight of 1,200 tons. Now there was a waiting period of 24 hours to settle the foundation blocks on the gravel pads prior to final positioning. Then the divers went down with underwater cutting torches and burned through the cables holding the foundation blocks to the element. In this end cross-section, we see the shape of the foundation blocks. Bearing on each block was the piston of a 300-ton hydraulic jack operating within the element itself. These facilitated precise control of vertical positioning Lateral movement was controlled by shims and screw jacks operated by divers. For the joining, the element was free to slide a few inches along the foundation blocks towards the element already in place. This was done with a pull exerted through the hook by two 75-ton hydraulic jacks inside the element. The rubber gasket around the face of the element sealed off the chamber between the elements. In all this engineering drama beneath the river surface, perhaps the most exciting event was the climax of making the join. With the gasket sealing the chamber between the elements, a valve was opened and a fraction of an inch of water bled off. This brought into play a hydrostatic pressure on the far end of the element of some three or four thousand tons. The rubber gasket was squeezed flat and the joint sealed completely. Thus the river itself was made to do man's bidding in the final conquest. The chamber could now be drained dry and the bulkhead doors opened for access through the elements. When element number six was placed and the chamber drained, the first entry was made an official ceremony. BC Minister of Highways, the Honorable P.A. Gillardy, and project manager Hans Benson were among the first men to cross from shore to shore under the great Fraser River. Dees Island Tunnel was now a reality. Much work remained. For example, the placing of sand under the elements entailed a unique operation. In fact, this feature alone made it possible to build a flat bottom tunnel. A steel scaffolding on wheels supporting sand hoppers and associated equipment was designed to run along the top of the tunnel elements. A sand and water mixture was forced through pipes to a special nozzle. Thus a sand bed was built up and packed under the flat element floor. The sand jetting pipe could be swung in half circles as shown in this model. The sand jetting rig, a significant contribution of Christiani and Nielsen experts, 
was one of several costly pieces of equipment specially built for the Dease Tunnel project. The mattress laying scow was another. This was used in the job called bottom protection. The mattresses were concrete, made flexible by lacing with stainless steel wire. The element was solidly in place when the sand had been jetted underneath and gravel backfilled up the sides. The concrete mattresses were then placed at the sides of the tunnel trench to prevent scouring by the river. Rock was laid on top of the mattresses and the element, and the river action silted up the remaining slight depression. Meanwhile, in the element, crews were breaking out the temporary bulkheads so heavy equipment could be moved into the tunnel. Here the hook remains engaged, but no longer needed. Water pressure now holds the elements together. In joining the elements to form one continuous tube, the collar of steel plate around each end of the elements was extended and welded. Reinforcing bars, loaded into the element in the dry dock, were then welded into position. With the pouring of concrete, the two elements became virtually one. Now the bulkheads could be broken down and the hook and eye removed. And final ballasting with concrete roadways was completed. The finishing touches to this vast project involved an army of detailed specialists. Concrete in the approaches and tunnel was sandblasted and given a rub finish. An important feature was the aluminum louvers installed in the approach ceilings to gradually decrease sunlight at the entrances. Artificial lighting in the tunnel was also graduated in intensity to provide the smoothest possible transition from outside to tunnel lighting and outside again. The tunnel and approaches were blacktopped from end to end. On both sides of the tunnel, contractors hastened construction of the new highway. Clover leaves and overpasses were planned for the safest high-speed travel at this new Fraser River crossing. Toll plazas were located at the North Tunnel approach on Lulu Island. An elaborate system of interlocking and automatic traffic signals was designed to meet all traffic loads and emergencies. Signals control traffic inside the tunnel as well. Safety equipment includes automatic fire alarms, carbon monoxide indicators, and telephones down the length of the tunnel. Normal automatic operation of the tunnel requires no control by supervisors. The complex of apparatus provides its own cross-checking and compensation. Under peak load or emergency conditions, one man can direct traffic and regulate ventilation from the central control room. The tunnel opened for traffic on May 23rd, celebrating its completion with a weekend of toll-free access. Despite the early hour, that first morning saw a lineup of cars waiting to christen the new tunnel. Public interest was high, though perhaps few could realize the tremendous concentration of effort and organization that this new river crossing represented. 
That first weekend, nearly a quarter of a million people came to try out their new tunnel. In July 1959, the tunnel had a royal visitor and an official opening. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, accompanied by His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, graciously consented to open the new tunnel at ceremonies on Dees Island. The party moved off to unveil two plaques commemorating the building of the tunnel. Appropriately enough, the Queen began her visit to Vancouver via the East Island Tunnel, having previously attended functions in New Westminster. The Royal Motorcade was greeted by thousands at the Vancouver end of the tunnel. From the tunnel throughway, the route of entry lies straight down Oak and Granville Streets to the heart of Vancouver. Now the job is done. The engineering dream, a reality. The hardships and the dangers are mere entries in technical reports. The men who built the tunnel have scattered to a hundred different jobs around the world. Memories are short, and this monumental achievement will soon be taken for granted. But it is all the greater for that. Dee's Island Tunnel is now more than an engineering project. It is the artery of a people whose future is more assured. Dee's Island Tunnel a triumph of today for British Columbia's tomorrow.